And remember, the closest emergency exit may be behind you. I'm going out these doors if there's a fire. <clears throat> ah, pig. More food. Like I need it after this week. Um, but good morning, everybody. Um, so as just mentioned, my name is Doug Wigman. I'll be talking about safety culture here in a moment. Uh, just a real brief uh, background about myself. I'm a professor of human factors engineering at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Badgers are in the final four, if anybody follows basketball. Thank you. Um, so uh, I've been there for uh, several years now, but uh, my background originally, um, when I first got started, I got, have, uh, got my PhD in cognitive psychology and got experience as an aviation psychologist in the U.S. Navy, working on human factors and, and safety um, for uh, several years, both on active duty and in the reserves. I uh, have served as a uh, human performance investigator for the United States National Transportation Safety Board in Washington, D.C., uh, doing uh, human performance uh, analyses of major commercial aviation accidents, and then went back into academia uh, at the University of Illinois Institute of Aviation, where I really got more involved in doing uh, research on safety culture for the FAA, which I'll, I'll kind of allude to here as I go through this presentation, give you a little bit more background as we, as we do this. And um, have since branched off. Aviation is something I'm still very passionate about, but for the last, I would say, 10 years or so of my, my uh, career, I've uh, gone into healthcare. And so I do quite a bit of patient safety and human factors research in healthcare settings, um, which uh, is uh, from coming from aviation is even scarier. If anybody knows about the statistics in healthcare, particularly in the United States, uh, medical error. Um, death due to medical error is estimated to be the eighth leading cause of death in the United States. So it's a huge problem um, and been doing some, a lot of research in that area, applying what we know from aviation and other industries to try and improve the safety of, of healthcare. So if you're sick, don't go to a hospital. But yeah. anyway, <clears throat> I can share more about that uh, after this session. Because um, safety culture is in fact an issue that's coming into healthcare and evolving from uh, the aviation industry and other industries, which I'll talk about. So uh, without further ado, let's uh, move on here um, and look at this, at safety culture. And so what I want to do is start out is give you all an exam, a uh, pretest, so to speak. And I want you to pull out a pencil and a pen, or a pen and paper, or pencil and paper, and I want you to write down the, the definition of safety culture. Finish this sentence for me. You walked into this room knowing we we're going to talk about culture and safety culture, and you probably had some preconceived notion about what that might entail. So I want you to, to write that down. Safety culture is defined as dot, dot, dot. And then I'm going to go around the room and ask for volunteers to share their definition. And if nobody volunteers, then I'll just pick you out. And you're not safe in the back of the room either, so uh, I can wander around. So I'll give you a couple minutes to do that. I can tell you're all a little older than my students in the university because they'd all pull out, pull out their smartphones and say, Google it. You can have the definition right there in front of them. Excuse me. Plenty of seats up here in the front. Come on in.
You can come on up front. Plenty of seats back up here. Okay, I'll still find you back there. Don't worry about it. All right, give you a couple more seconds to finish up your thoughts. Oh, the brave soul. Okay, great. All right, pencils down or pens.
and what it means. So what I want to do next is I'm going to show, uh, I think it's about a seven minute YouTube video of a company who produces videos to highlight their safety culture. This is actually construction <coughs> industry. And there's nothing to disclose on my part because I have no idea who this company is. I have no affiliation with this company. I have no association with it. It's just a good example of a company who is trying to improve their safety culture. And so if you listen to this video, what I want you to do is either mentally take notes or on a piece of paper the things that this company describes as being reflective of their safety culture or what they're doing or the things that they do um, that they feel uh, is reflective of a good, their good safety culture or not. Okay, and then we're going to, then I'll open it up again for discussion to get people's ideas of what they, what they gleaned from this, this video. And hopefully the audit, the uh, sound will work. Well, when I started out in, in the industry 25 years ago, safety was not a focus. It wasn't something that, that people thought about. In fact, it was never trained for. Before OSHA, it used to be a rule of thumb that a person would die for every floor that was built. Unfortunately, construction is dangerous. It's still the leading cause of fatalities of employees. That's something that not only ourselves, but the industry wants to change. Oops, sorry. Did I do that? I'd like to welcome all of you to Centennial Safety Day. I'd like to thank Centennial for letting us come down here and do this for you. Our focus on safety came about basically from an understanding that we needed to move away from meeting regulations to something that really makes a difference in the industry. We wanted to strip away any ambiguity. We wanted to say that safety is the most important thing we do. It's more important than profit, than customer satisfaction, than quality, than schedule. And if we can't do it safely, we're not going to do it. The hockey players, the Olympic skaters, they're not afraid to wear the equipment. The safety culture, to me, is something that you take no exceptions to. Some clients, you know, safety is first. Some clients, they say safety is first, but you know, they don't necessarily hold you to it. But within Centennial, we make no exceptions. We're going to go out and we're going to be safe, period. Centennial is a company who really believes in safety. A lot of companies talk about safety. Some of them just do it uh, to prevent the penalties from OSHA. Uh, Centennial is not that way. They truly want every person to go home in the same physical shape that they came to work. This shows the life safety plan we want to get safety staff involved early to understand what are the hazards, the potential hazards that we could face in addressing this work and building it into the scope of work up front, taking a proactive role before we even get to the field. That's a big, big help. So over the years, we've been able to reduce the incidents in the field because we build it in ahead of time. We're also going to make sure that every subcontractor that's working on those projects are adhering to our strict safety standards. There's no exceptions. And when, when owners typically understand that that's how we operate, you know, they get it. It's something that the owners are seeing us not just talk about, but actually do. I know few companies who actually put the stop work authority, the responsibility, and the moral obligation to stop work when unsafe work is going on in the hands of each and every individual in the company. And that's, that's a real cutting edge idea. And that's the difference between paying lip service to safety and doing something about it. Our core values or our value statement, what, what's the most important element? Culture takes time to build, and it's a consistent, predictable behavior. And people are saying, you know, I'm invincible, or um, I've done this before, and those are the paradigms that you have to change and to break. 
If there's one thing that we train our new employees at, at orientation, it's safety. We spend over half of the time giving them safety certifications and training. And we have a number of full-time safety professionals. And talk about passion. Those individuals are very passionate about safety. If my harness has no other place but to go up, an organization has to make a decision. Is safety a check in the box, or is it something that we really believe in? You know, we're trying to help people change their culture and make safety a critical component of what they do. It's not going to do us any good to have a harness, so we need to put a guardrail system in place to protect our workers. We have a safety fair, which is more of an all-day affair. And then on smaller jobs, we would have a safety luncheon. We use a conversion factor where we multiply a dead weight. We'll do OSHA training on various segments. We'll do fall protection. We'll do pieces of OSHA 10 first aid. We'll do crane demonstrations. Uh, we'll do the, the Waldo walk where we set up stations. We have 10 stations. And what we're looking to do is quiz people's knowledge and try to reinforce their understanding of what's right and what's wrong. Until you see a power company person come there and tell you that that's safe to work on, you shouldn't touch that. We focus on small businesses. These are the people that are coming to our safety fairs. Now we're having an opportunity to educate them at no cost on various elements of safety. And so by doing that, you, you're able to touch a lot of people's lives and help them develop safety programs. Feedback from participants is, has always been positive. They recognize uh, Centennial is willing to shut down a job and spend a day. Bring me here. It must be important to them. Our goal is for zero lost time accidents. How you still get production in the field and how you keep that zero lost time accident. They're not diametrically opposed. They're one and the same how many work hours we put in with, with no lost time. It's really off the charts. It's one of our strongest points when we, when we go to win new work. We can tout our safety program, just how few um, accidents we have. What we hear from customers are, so what you say is really true. You are trying to make a difference. You are doing something different. It's easy to talk about safety, but to actually do something about safety, that's where the rubber meets the road. Okay, let's talk about that for a few minutes here. What were some of the things that jumped out at you
So there's a variety of things there in that, in that video, and probably more than we've covered here. Um, but those are kind of cornerstone ideas behind safety culture. And as you think about your definition when we started out, and now watching that video, you can kind of look and see how your definition matches up for some of the things that this company did. So what I'm going to do for the rest of the time here, it's just kind of an overview. I'm going to talk a little bit about the background and history of the concept of safety culture. Uh, what are the indicators of an organization's safety culture, which we've kind of been talking about? What are the things that are reflective of it? How do we, how do we look at it? How do we identify it? And then talk briefly about how do we measure safety culture. Um, also talk about just how do we change it or can it be changed? And then a conclusion section. And hopefully we have time at the end to go around and share folks in the room who are already doing safety culture assessments in your organization. There's probably a few people or, uh, or more in here already doing some of this stuff. And part of the session would be to, is kind of to share with other people in, in the industry, not just listen to me up here and talking. So um, hopefully we have time to just kind of to chat a little bit and share ideas about how other companies do this. 
So some learning objectives, hopefully by the end, uh, be able to have at least a, a broader, maybe a more refined definition of safety culture in addition to the one you started out with, as well as safety climate, which is a term that's often used or confused with the concept of safety culture. I'll talk about that. Um, then we'll talk about proactive uh, perspective or proactive versus retrospective uh, issues of safety culture briefly. Uh, and then more depth of the indicators of safety culture with some examples and then measuring and changing safety culture as I just mentioned. People who, historians who look at safety and study this stuff, um, really trace back the term safety culture as being used um, as a causal factor, contributing factor to a major industrial accident. Um, trace it back to being introduced uh, to, uh, with regard to the nuclear power um, uh, explosion in, in Chernobyl back in 1986, where the International Atomic Energy Agency noted a poor safety culture as a factor in the accident. So this is maybe the concept might have been around a little bit, but this is where most people see it as a, a major accident report where, where the investigation body cited safety culture as, as contributing to the accident. About a year later, uh, in Great Britain, Kings Cross Underground Fire uh, in 1987, and this was a fire that broke out uh, in a subway system. Uh, during commuting hours, a major fire broke out, and 31 people died um, because they couldn't escape. They couldn't get out of this, the subway. These are pictures of the burnt escalators. It's kind of, kind of hard to see. But essentially, uh, poor safety culture was cited as contributing to the deaths of these individuals because when the system was designed, safety was not considered in terms of a need for any mass evacuation. And so the safety exits, the, 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 abil the ability for people to get out quickly um, was not considered in the construction of this system. And so as a result, several people were trapped or could not get out and died in that fire. Uh, we're all probably familiar with Piper Alpha back in 1988, uh, the worst offshore petroleum accident during which 167 people died and the billion dollar platform was destroyed and poor safety calls were cited contributing to this accident. As we're all familiar, fire broke out um, and the ability to again escape the, uh, the emergency um, uh, procedures and life rafts and all of those different types of things were not available. A lot of people jumped from the platform and died. Other people burned in the, in the, uh, in the fire, in the explosion, and um, it was a major catastrophe. Again, safety culture, not really worrying about safety as much as let's get this thing built. It's going to be the best thing ever, um, and as a result, people died. Then in aviation, uh, it kind of creeped in in the early 90s and then later in the mid 90s, where now the aviation industry is starting to get involved with this concept of safety culture. Uh, Continental Express Flight 2574, uh, back in the early 90s, where the NTSB cites, cited the probable cause as the failure of Continental Express management to establish a corporate culture that encouraged and enforced adherence to approved maintenance and quality control procedures. And then later on, Tom Air Flight 3272 in the mid-90s, Tom Air's poor safety culture contributed to its failure to establish and adequately disseminate unambiguous minimum airspeed values for flap configuration and for flight into icing conditions. And so we have here in the 90s, two major commercial aviation accidents in the United States um, in which the NTSB cites corporate culture, safety culture, culture kind of issues um, as contributing to the accident. And so in aviation, this, this raised a lot of eyebrows when the NTSB started using these terms because they hadn't really been talked about before in, in, in this language. And so now all of a sudden, airlines are being held responsible for somehow their safety culture, whatever that is. Um, at the time, everybody's like, well, what are you talking about? How do I how can you hold me accountable for something and I don't even know what it is, I don't know how to measure it, there's no, there's no regulation that tells me what I need to do about it, um, what's going on here? And so it caused a lot of concern in the aviation industry um, just because it was something that they were going to be held accountable for and they didn't really know what it was. Um, so back in 1997, the NTSB held a national summit on transportation safety 
Uh, I actually attended this summit um, when I was at the board and um, where they brought in um, a lot of mostly academic speakers. Uh, Jane, Reason, Jane Reason was there. I think the late Bob Helmreich was there um, and a variety of other people coming in and just talking about culture and what culture is and how it relates to operations and, and a variety of uh, transportation industries at, to the extent to which we knew at that time. And just kind of introduced it to the aviation industry. Unfortunately, at the time, it was still new in aviation as well, and we were still feeling our way through it. And so a lot of people, I would say the majority of people, left that summit still scratching their head, saying we still, we came in, and I don't know if we know any more about it than we did when we walked in the door, other than listening to a lot of, a lot of academics wax philosophic about some concept that's somewhat nebulous. Um, some of it was just, um, just people kind of brainstorming about the topic. So there's a big... Um, uh, issues still going on there, and I'll come back to that here in a moment. Since then, um, a variety of other accidents uh, have been attributed to a poor safety culture. The Columbia Space Shuttle accident uh, in 2003, uh, the refinery explosion, BP Texas City back in 2005 um, that exploded and, and killed several people and injured many others uh, was cited as poor safety culture and so on. And then hindsight's always being used. Now, a new concept comes up and people will say, well, is this, is this a new concept, safety culture? Is it just evolved in the late uh, uh, 20th century? Or is this safety culture issue really been around for a long period of time? We just didn't recognize it and or define it in such a way. You know, maybe it's really an old concept that we just didn't, we didn't know about. And so people will go back retrospectively and look at previous accidents like Three Mile Island, the Challenger shuttle accident, the Titanic, and apply this idea of safety culture and have shown or have attempted to show that, hey, safety culture was a big issue way back when. We just didn't, we just didn't realize it or acknowledge it. We were looking at other things. So it's a concept that presumably had been around for a much longer time than the Chernobyl accident, which was first introduced. We just didn't realize it. But in any case, uh, what I kind of want to talk about um, is way do we look at safety culture and why do we look at it? Well, one of the, the reasons why we do it um, is not because we're waiting for an accident to happen and then go back and analyze that accident to see if safety culture has contributed to it, which so far that's kind of what I've been talking about is accidents happening and then identifying a poor safety culture as causing the accident or contributing to it. What we want to do is right, be proactive rather than retrospective. We want to know how do we identify our safety culture today before a major event happens, because that's ultimately what we want to do. We want to be proactive. We want to look at the risks in our system associated with safety culture, mm -hmm. at least those things that are associated with safety culture, since that's the topic we're talking about today. And so identify those problems before bad things happen, assess the risks that your safety culture might pose to your organization, and then somehow intervene to change your safety culture, reduce those risks associated with your safety culture so that Nothing bad actually happens. That's the ultimate goal, right? Not just going back and looking at previous accidents. So we want, the reason why we're concerned about safety culture is because we want to do something about it now rather than wait and be proactive and do our risk assessments using something associated with the safety culture. The problem is, as I mentioned before, that there's been a variety of studies looking at safety culture over the years uh, in a variety of domains. As I just showed, it didn't originate in aviation. It, re it originated in a variety of different industries. There's generally a lack of consistency in definitions. We just heard a few definitions in this room earlier uh, in this session, and we found some differences and similarities. So people tend to define it differently, which means then they're going to measure it differently and determine whether or not they changed it differently. Such terms as safety climate, as I alluded to earlier, often add to the confusion. What's the difference? Does it really matter? Efforts to study safety culture, here's a quote from the literature, it remains unsystematic, fragmented, and in particular underspecified in theoretical terms. In other words, everybody's doing their own thing and nobody's doing the same thing. So we need some consistency here. And so this is where I originally got involved with safety culture um, research as an academic as well as interested in just the pragmatics of improving it for the industry. Um, because after the, the NTSB started getting involved in this, the FAA, Said, okay, well, we're, we're going to have to start providing guidance to organizations. We're going to have to start somehow 
evaluating safety culture in some systematic way, or at least giving the industry some tools that they can use to evaluate their own safety culture. And so um, in working uh, with the FAA through the university, I had several uh, grants that they asked my research team to dive into this topic and try to really understand it and give the FAA feedback on what is it, can you measure it, can you change it, what are some of the issues that we, we need to deal with here. And so that's what we did. We started working on this concept of safety culture. And again, we found a variety of definitions by doing a, a major literature review uh, on the topic. And I'll just show you a few of these definitions. And there's technical reports on this that have dozens upon dozens of definitions if you want a literature review on what safety culture is. Because um, there are a variety of definitions. Some of them overlap, uh, some of them don't. But let's just look at a few here. Safety culture is defined as a shared values, beliefs, assumptions, and norms which may govern organizational decision making as well as individual and group attitudes about safety. Safety culture reflects attitudes, beliefs, perceptions, and values that employees share in relation to safety. A safety culture exists within an organization where each individual employee, regardless of their position, assumes an active role in error prevention and that role is supported by the organization. And then finally, safety culture is defined as the attitudes, values, norms, and beliefs which a particular group of people share with respect to risk and safety. Again, these are just a, a sample of some of the definitions that are out there. And you can see that there are some similarities across these definitions and some differences. But when we look at some of the common themes about safety culture derived from many more than these four definitions, uh, we, we see some common themes. Number one, safety culture is a concept defined at group level and ho or higher, which refers to the shared values among all group members of an organization, group or organizational members. Safety culture is concerned with formal safety issues in an organization and closely related to, but not restricted to, the management and supervisory systems. Uh, number, f uh, got distracted, sorry. Number three, safety culture emphasizes the contribution of everyone at every level of an organization. Number four, the safety culture of an organization has an impact on its members' behavior at work, which kind of may seem kind of obvious, but if it doesn't impact behavior, why do we worry about it? So we assume that it does. Number five, safety culture is usually reflected in the contingency between wards and safety performance. So there's some connection between that behavior at work and how I'm rewarded or not rewarded. Uh, number six, safety culture is reflected in an organization's willingness to develop and learn from errors, incidents, and accidents. So it's a learning culture. And then number seven, safety culture is relatively enduring, stable, and resistant to change, which is an important thing to think about. Re stable and resistant to change. That's why it's culture. Culture tends to be very resistant and slow to change which has an impact on how we do our job as safety professionals when we're trying to change safety culture. So that's a major issue. Safety climate, what's the difference? Well, safety climate is a concept that's been around much longer than safety culture, at least in the open literature. It goes way back to the late 60s, early 70s uh, with a researcher named Zohor uh, from Israel who did quite a bit of work in industrial safety and came up with this concept of safety climate. And so there's been quite a bit more work historically on the concept of safety climate. And so it makes you question, well, why if safety climate's been around for a while, why do we have to introduce a new concept? Why do we have to introduce safety culture if we already had safety climate as a concept we, we already know about and we can, we can use? But there are a variety of definitions of safety climate, and I'll just give you a few here. Um, safety climate refers to the perceived state of a safety, state of safety of a particular place at a particular time. It's therefore relatively unstable and subject to change depending on features of the operating environment. The procedures and rules governing safety within an organization are a reflection of its safety climate, which is centered around employees' perceptions of the importance of safety and how it's maintained within the workplace. That's from Bassey. Safety climate is defined as the product of employee perceptions and attitudes about a current state of safety initiatives at their workplace. And then finally, safety climate is a surface features of safety culture. So here the authors are trying to distinguish between the two. Discern from the workforce's attitudes and perceptions at a given point in time. 
So there's a variety of definitions of safety climate. Again, this is all, there are dozens upon dozens of definitions of these that, that are in technical reports that I can uh, refer you to if you're interested in, in uh, if you have insomnia some night and you're just trying to get to sleep, great, great stuff here. <clears throat> so definitions of safety climate, here's some common themes. Climate is a psychological phenomena, which is usually defined as the perceptions of the state of a safety at a particular time. So it's more of a point in time than an enduring feature, like culture. Closely concerned with intangible issues such as situational environmental factors, so it's more situationally based. And safety climate is a temporal phenomena or snapshot of safety culture, relatively unstable and subject to change. So there's some differences here in how people perceive climate versus culture. I think that's why they call it climate, right? If you don't like the climate, wait a little while and it'll change because it constantly, can constantly change depending on uh, the situations that's going on within an industry or within the company. So definitions. Um, a couple working definitions here. Uh, they're relatively uh, long, but I'll read them to you because we're going to break them down, at least for the safety culture one here. So from all these different definitions, here's the definition that our group came up with. Safety culture, the enduring value and priority placed on worker and public safety by everyone in every group at every level of an organization, refers to the extent to which individuals and groups will commit to personal responsibility for safety, act to preserve, enhance, and communicate safety concerns, strive to actively learn, adapt, and modify both individual and organizational behavior based on lessons learned from mistakes, and be rewarded in a manner consistent with these values. In contrast, safety climate is the temporal state measure of safety culture subject to commonalities among individual perceptions of the organization. It's situationally based, refers to the perceived state of safety at a particular place at a particular time, relatively unstable and subject to change depending on the features of the current environment or prevailing conditions. So there's lengthy compound definitions. The, the way I like to think about the differences between safety culture and safety climate is kind of how we view pers people's personality, right? We all kind of believe that we all have a personality, right? We all have a kind of core thing So we need to think about that when we're, well, what are we changing and how do we change it? So that's, that's kind of the reason why we go through this theoretical mumbo jumbo of coming up with these definitions, because it has an impact on the pragmatics of what we do with this, co this concept. Finally, safety culture tends to be, um, what we've discerned is a matter of degree, not existence. It's arranged from poor to excellent, not presence, from absence. 
And again, this just has an impact on how we conceptualize safety culture, how we measure it, and how we try to change it. What I'm, what I'm here, sometimes I'll, I'll hear people say that our company lacks a safety culture. My response is, no, it doesn't. No organization lacks a safety culture. It just may not be very good, is really what you're telling me. And you want to make it better. Because when you think of it, if you think that your company lacks a safety culture, what that implies then is I can go get a program, boom, plug it into my organization, and now I have a safety it doesn't work that way. It's on a continuum. We're constantly trying to improve our safety culture um, in different ways and different aspects of it. So think of it more of a continuum rather than the presence or absence of something. You're not going to instill a safety culture with a single program. You're going to have to assess your safety culture, figure out what it is, figure out what dimensions of your safety culture are good or not good, and then how do we, how do we go about improving it or changing it. And so we break down safety culture into four main elements. And basically based on that definition I just gave you, we break down that definition into different components of a safety culture. And again, the reason why we do this is because safety culture is complex. And so if you want to address your safety culture, maybe you don't try to address all these at one time. Maybe you pick one aspect of it and say, okay, let's pick one of these dimensions and let's see if we can push it along, get it a little bit better. And if we can, let's choose another element of our safety culture and see if we can push that along rather than trying to swallow the elephant in one, or eat the elephant in one swallow. Um, and so if you break it down, it helps identify what could be changed. It also helps in assessing it and, and evaluating it and so on. Now these are four. If you look in the literature, again, if you read some of these reports, um, or look in, look in the, the published literature, you'll see that people have a variety of different concepts of how many dimensions there are. Some are up to 18 dimensions of safety culture. Some are down to one or two. We started out, I think, when we first started this, we started out with like eight. And then doing our research and assessments, we were able to combine some together uh, and different subcomponents to kind of balance the theoretical with the pragmatic. Right? You, want, you want it to be legitimate, but you also want it to be usable. If you have too many parameters, too many dimensions, it just gets unwielding and you're never going to be able to, to really get a handle on it. So I'm going to kind of walk you through uh, some of these and maybe give you some examples where I can. So the first one is organizational commitment. The extent to which the upper level management identifies safety as quote unquote a core value or guiding principle of the organization. It's reflected by upper levels management to demonstrate an enduring positive attitude towards safety, even in times of fiscal austerity, which means money's tight, um, actively promote and fund safety activities across all organizational levels. Again, this kind of goes back to the video we saw, that safety is viewed by upper level management as more than just compliance. We are going to invest in safety. Safety is going to be a priority, and, for, and we're going to fund it, and we're going to shut down a job and have a safety day, uh, even if it's going to cost us money because we, now we have a whole day that nothing was done on the site. But we're going to invest in safety because it's a core value of our company. So a lot of times when money's tight, right, we've all been there, it's everybody, uh, particularly in the last year or so, um, with, uh, with the economy and other types of things, um, that you know, when, when money's tight, a lot of times the first two things that go in, company, in companies are safety and training, and particularly safety training. Right? If money's tight and you say, hey, I really want to go to the CHC summit, and well, you know, we'd really love to send you there as well, but money's tight. You know, we're just not going to be able to send you this year. There's probably people who are not here whose company has made that decision. Right? We can't, we, you know, we have to cut back on our travel budget. And, you know, so it's not really that important. Other things are more important versus your organizations, whether money's tight or not, hopefully it's not, but it may be, they still valued this summit. They still valued the, to pay for your way to come and learn something because they want you to bring something back to help make their, their, your organization safer. They've invested in you and they sent you here. So these are the types of things we're talking about. The organization uh, commits to that and it's a core value. When, we do, when I do safety, have done safety culture assessments for airlines, one of the questions we ask is to the, to the line pilots and other folks is that, 
is basically is safety a core value in your organization? What do you what do you think? Um, and when we ask upper level management, they say absolutely it's a core value in our organization. It's in our mission statement. You know, it's on there. And then you ask the pilots and they ask, is it a core value of our organization? And one of the responses we get is, I don't know what that means. I've never heard that term before in my life. So somewhere there's a big disconnect between what management considers a core value and what the line pilots feel is really going on and what message gets down there. And it's often uh, watered down as it comes down from top for a variety of reasons, as well as information going up gets watered down. So this is what we're talking about. Is your organization really committed to that? And how do they invest their money in safety and, and good equipment and maintenance of equipment and all those types of things? Here's a little cartoon, organizational commitment. This is a major pro there's a safety and quality gal here and the boss is saying, this is a major project of utmost importance, but it has no budget, no guidelines, no support staff, and it's due in 15 minutes at last. Here's your chance to really impress everyone. I mean, how many times do we feel like that? How many unfunded mandates do we have in our organization? We need to do this, but there's no more money in the budget, so we're gonna have to find money for somewhere or you're just gonna have to do it without any additional funding. Unfunded mandates, but make it happen. Show us, your, show us your stellar, show us your star. So that's kind of what we're talking about. Leadership involvement. The extent to which both upper and mid-level leaders get personally involved in critical organization safety activities. Are they really engaged? It's reflected by presence and contributions of leadership to safety seminars and training, active oversight of safety critical operations, the ability to stay in touch with the risks involved in everyday operations and have good communications about safety issues both up and down the organizational hierarchy. So the presence and contributions to safety seminars and training. Do the leadership get involved in that? I've been, I've been in organizations given, given safety talks, safety stand downs at squadrons in the military and so on, and oftentimes I've seen this. The director of safety or the VP of safety or the commanding officer of the squadron will get up and say, you know, really, you know, welcome everybody. This is going to be a great day. You know, safety officer Smith over here has really lined up some great speakers for us today. They got some really important stuff to talk about. I want you to pay attention and listen up and take, get, you know, take home the message. Okay. Oh, and by the way, see ya, wouldn't want to be ya. And they walk out of the room. Well, if it's so dang important, why don't you sit down and listen to this? You've got more important things to do, but this is so important that you don't even sit here and listen to it. What message does that send to everybody? Yeah, really not that big a deal, right? I've got more important things to do. I've been to other organizations where VP of Ops, even sometimes the President and CEO, I mean, just like here we have for CHC, we've got some really... Um, uh, high level, uh, we got people here at the summit contributing to it, sitting through it, listening to it. And I've been to organizations where the top leadership will basically be sitting in the front table or front row and they'll be there all day. And they'll be the ones asking most of the questions, constantly asking questions, probing, how can I use this? What does this mean for our folks? And everybody else in the room sees this. And they're saying, oh my goodness, if the VP can sit here, and sit through this all day and thinks it's important to ask questions, that sends a huge message to everybody else in the room, in the organization. This must be important. He does or she does care about this stuff. So are they involved or are they just giving it lip service? In that video, I don't know if you noticed it, you only saw it for a brief time, but in one of the training sessions, the president and CEO was sitting there in the front room and actually talking and doing stuff in that, in that orientation, in that meeting. It sends a huge message that it is valued. Oversight to be able to stay in touch with the risks involved in everyday operations, right? We all know in aviation we have chief pilots, right? And chief pilots are required to fly the line a certain number of hours over a period of time, so many hours in a month or a quarter or so on, depending on the type of operation. So why is it that um, chief pilots are required to fly the line? Sorry, I'm a chief pilot. Why are, why are they? What's the 
politically correct answer? To stay in touch. To stay in touch. That's the politically correct answer. The real answer is to stay current, right? Because I have talked to a few pilots, and you know, I, I ask them, they say, you know, why, why do you continue? And they say, well, to stay current, because if I ever get hired flying to be the chief pilot, I can help manage my stuff, and I can go fly the line again, right? So that's why I do it. So I'm ready to go back to work if I need to. But really, the, the key is one of the reasons is to stay in touch, to get out there, rub elbows with the with the, the common folk, right? See what's going on out there. And so, when again do these safety culture assessments, some of the some of the comments I might get from pilots who fly the line say, "Oh yeah, our chief pilot, when he does fly, he cherry picks the best aircraft, flies the best schedule to the best destination he goes to." And I go back to the chief pilot and I say, "This is what you're supposed to." Cherry pick the best aircraft, you fly the best schedule to the best destination. The chief pilot will say, Well, of course, that's a benefit to me too. Probably too. <laughs> you know, what's the big deal? You know, and I you know my response is, well, if you really want to stay in touch with the risks out there where that captain might be, why don't you fly your worst aircraft on the worst schedule to the worst destination? You should fly over to Thailand where your traffic controller is barely speaking English and you have no maintenance facility to deal with. So maybe that's So you want to stay in touch of what's going on out there. Now when I talk to line pilots and they say, well, we don't want our chief pilot flying the worst aircraft, worst schedule, worst destination, we're crashing air traffic, but that's a different thing. I totally, I already apologize to chief pilots. No, no one's, no one's, everybody's fair game. Uh, maintenance direct, directors of maintenance, right? Maintenance goes on at night most of the time, right? Your VP of maintenance. Works, how often do you see him walking around the shop floor, her walking around the shop floor at night? Maybe once a quarter. And when they do it, they pat themselves on the back. See, guys, I'm suffering with you. Right? How often do they stay in touch? Do they really know what's going on? So that's what we're talking about, leadership involvement. Or are they just too busy being leaders and their paperwork and all those different types of things? Or, and again, this is from a safety perspective, are they in touch? And is there good communica communication up and down the hierarchy? And as I mentioned before, a lot of times there isn't, in poor safety cultures, there isn't a good communication up. Because middle management will water it down to upper management because after all, upper management doesn't like to hear bad news, right? And I wanna get promoted someday. So I'm not gonna be the naysayer, nabob of negativism and talk about all the safety issues because that's not what they wanna hear. Leadership involvement. Here's a staff meeting to improve safety. Two people there. It appears that everyone heard that the boss was not planning on attending. The boss isn't here, why have the meeting? Can't look good when he's not here or she's not here. Um, so let's go do something else. Formal safety systems. Refers to the process for identifying and addressing both occupational process safety hazards. We're all familiar with these types of things, reporting systems. You know, accessibility, familiarity, actual use, feedback and response, timeliness and appropriateness of responses to safety issues, a concept we call transparency, is information disseminated back, not only to the person who reported the safety issue, but to everybody in the organization who might need to know it. And then safety personnel, perceived effectiveness and status of persons involved in formal safety roles. So reporting systems, we're all familiar with that. We have ASAP now and a variety of different aviation uh, uh, organizations, uh, at least in the US and, and part of in Canada. Uh, basically anonymous reporting systems or just reporting systems in general um, there. Is it used? I mean, how many times you walk around an organization and you see that suggestion box on the wall that has dust all over it? Nobody even knows where the key is for it anymore, right? Uh, probably suggestions in there back from 1970. Uh, so, is it used? Do people know about it? Um, and can they find it? Is how hard is it to use? Is it online? Or do I have to go fill out a piece of paper and find that paper somewhere? Um, that type of thing. Are people familiar with it and do they use it? Feedback and response. Obviously, we know that if you people put forward suggestions and they don't get any feedback, people stop using it. It's just not, there's no mechanism in the process to get that feedback to people. And then this idea of when you give feedback or how is that feedback proposed? Is it transparent? Do we, tell it, do, we, do we share it with other people in the organization who may also have the same problem even though they haven't reported it? 
This is a major issue in healthcare. Transparency, for the most part, does not exist in healthcare, other than the mandatory reporting that any particular state will require a hospital to report. There are certain mandatory things they need to report. Other types of things they don't need to report. And oftentimes they don't report it to their own organization. They don't report it without, outside their own little uh, division. So the work I do, a lot of it is in surgery. And most uh, major hospitals have a variety of divisions of surgery. Right? You're gonna have cardiac surgery, you can have neurosurgery, you can have general surgery, you can have bariatric surgery, you're gonna have uh, orthopedic surgery, you can have a variety of different vascular surgery, you can have a variety of different divisions of surgery all in their own little division, have their own all division meetings and so on. And so when something bad happens in, in an operating room, say in cardiovascular surgery, heart surgery, something bad happens and, and they, they, you know, patient gets harmed or something like that, they'll get together, close the door and they'll talk about it. And the surgeons will all get together and chat about why it happened and what they're gonna do about it to prevent it from happening again. That's it. They leave the room. No one else in surgery outside of that division of surgery knows about it. They don't tell anybody. They don't want anybody to know. Has, they might have issues of reputation and all these other types of things. And so the problem with that is that the problem that the cardiac surgeons may have had in the operating room may be the same problem that the orthopedic surgeons are having and they don't share that information, which might have a similar problem that the bariatric surgeons are having. And so nobody talks and shares, and so nobody's learning from each other. There's no transparency. And the transparency is important because that's how we learn as an organization. Just because an event happened over in this division doesn't mean it's not relevant to another division. And so why wait for that division to have the same problem when we could have learned from it? And so how much transparency is there in your organization? And that's very, very important, how the information is used and how it's disseminated. And then finally, safety personnel, perceived effectiveness and status of persons involved in safety. Um, this is, this is I, I teach safety uh, at the university, um, and my students are very surprised when I tell them that, you know, people involved in safety aren't always the most popular people in their organization. And they look at me and say, what? Well, why not? I mean, it, they're out there to save lives. It's altruistic, right? They, they have good motives. They should be loved. Everybody should welcome the safety person into the room, right? And they're surprised that that doesn't always happen. Safety people are involved that they're, they're a nuisance, right? They slow everything down. They always make problems. And, and, you know, let's not invite them to the next meeting. So the idea that safety people, how are, the, how are they viewed within your organization? How is a safety position seen within your organization? People involved in safety seen as up and comers? Or are they seen as the old guy going out the door? Right? Someone who's, you know, their, their, their time is over. Let's put them in safety. Right? So there was this one company that I worked with, uh, worked with um, as a consultant. Uh, it, was, it was a uh, chemical processing company, major company. Um, and they were building a refinery over in South Korea. They were building this refinery, multi-million dollar refinery. They were trying to corner the market on this new chemical they were trying to produce. Well, it turns out that uh, upon startup of this refinery, it blew up. <sighs> burned down, burned to a crisp. Not only did they lose millions of dollars from burning down their, their, their facility, they also lost a corner on the market, which was probably billions of dollars lost. And so they, they asked me to come in, they, they figured out, they said, we think we had a problem with our safety culture, so can you come help us figure this out? So I went in and I uh, served kind of as a, as a guide and consultant to this company. And in their investigation, what they discovered, I didn't do the mechanical uh, aspect of the investigation, they did that, but they discovered that upon man, when they're manu uh, constructing this facility, one of their venue, uh, or vendors, that produced a washer went out of business. Little washer, not very big. And so the people who were uh, responsible for the uh, guiding, you know, uh, governing the manufacturing of this plant decided they just went out and said, well, we'll find another vendor, uh, vendor for a washer. And so they did. They didn't, they didn't do a change of management. They didn't go back to risk. Safety folks, they just made the decision on their own. I mean, how hard can it be? It's just a little washer. 
And so what happened was, is the old washer was made out of rubber. The new washer was made out of metal. The old washer was not just a sealant, but it was an insulator. The new one sealed just fine, but it arced, sparked, and blew everything up. So this one decision, and they figured out that people in, in production didn't want to go back and do the change management and go back to safety and, and the risk folks because they're, they're a problem. They would slow us down. They would have to do all this paperwork and all this stuff and, you know, what's the big deal? It's just a washer. And so the idea was is that in this company, their safety culture is one where safety people were not valued. They were seen as problems. In fact, safety was viewed as a black hole. People go into safety and you never see them again. They never come out. What's going on here? You know, and all the up and comers, all the young folks coming into the company will always get the guidance, do not go into safety. You know, you want to go into maintenance, to, the, to ops, to production. Don't go into safety. No one promotes out of safety, right? There, and it, it was true. There was no directors, there was no VPs, there was no board of directors that had ever had any safety experience. They'd all done those other things. And so safety wasn't really considered value. And so one of the recommendations I made, which they hated, was that if you want to change your safety culture, if you want to change your perspective of safety, you need to change your policy. You need to change it that if you want to get promoted, ever want to get promoted to a director or VP or to the board of directors in this company, you have to have spent two years in safety. So that when you get there and you're making those decisions, you know what it's like and you know that you actually can appreciate what value safety brings. And so now it becomes a coveted billet, a coveted job. Everybody now wants to go into safety because if you don't get that ticket punch, you're not going to get promoted. And so it changed the whole idea of how important safety was. If the company really thinks safety is valued, then they're going to require everybody to get that experience. Respect for safety personnel. How come you never bring me any of those stupid ideas anymore? Then finally, uh, informal safety um, refers to unwritten norms pertaining to safety behavior, including rewards and punishments for safe and unsafe actions, the manner in which such rewards and punishments are instituted in a just and fair manner. So we're talking about accountability, kind of consistency and appropriateness, uh, which people are held accountable, the authority, which we saw in the video, the stop work authority type of things, where employees are involved in decision making related to safety, and then professionalism where there's peer-to-peer -peer, uh, norms pertaining to safety, it should be two, not tow, safe and unsafe behavior. So that the group norms and the people feel free to talk up and challenge one another uh, about safety. And so accountability is a little bit different than what we see in other industries where it's rewards and punishments. We found that that really translate into flight deck safety because pilots would say, you know, I don't, I don't expect to be rewarded for not crashing my airplane today. I don't need an attaboy, you didn't crash. That doesn't that's not it. What we want is accountability or fairness. We talk about a just culture, right? So if, if, I do, if I'm involved in an incident and it's not my fault, then the company shouldn't hold me accountable. If it's my fault and I did something intentionally wrong and I knew it was wrong and I had an accident, then that might be a different story. Or a colleague of mine does that. That's a different story. But if they're not responsible, then they're not responsible. And then again, stop work authority, we talked about professionalism being able to challenge one another and make sure that those peer pressures to follow safety procedures are there at the bottom end. Justice and accountability, don't think of it as getting fired, think of it as a 100% tax cut. We could use a tax cut right now. Uh, so assessing safety culture, um, there's a variety of methods, we're not gonna go into detail here, uh, interviews, focus groups, you know, basically talking to people, asking questions related to these different dimensions observations, just observing people, or a more fancy word now, it's called ethnography. Um, it's kind of the, what we call the, the Jane Goodall approach, you know, go live among the chimpanzees and, and see how they function. Um, and so basically you try to become one of, the, one of the group members so they no longer feel you're an outsider and then they start acting normally and, and you get to understand the culture of it. It's kind of something I did when I was studying surgery is just becoming a member of wasn't doing surgery, I didn't sleep at a Holiday Inn last night, but, um, but basically being part of the group, being part of the meetings, just kind of hanging out and becoming one of, the, one of the team. But then there's survey and questionnaires which are the most common. 
Um, and again, this might be interesting if we have time to talk amongst ourselves about how people, uh, what they use and how they do it. Um, it allows for a broad assessment of people. So we did, this is our approach. Uh, we identified thousand questions from a variety of different surveys across industries. Some of them are redundant because they build on each other. We didn't ask a thousand questions. I think we boiled it down to about 80, um, which is probably still too many, um, and developed a couple uh, questionnaires uh, that are out there um, that uh, we produced and used and validated. And there's some research out there that, that shows the validation in some of these surveys. But they're available. I can, I can show you where they're at online um, and there. And then finally, after we've done all this, we defined it, we've come up with examples and questions and so on. Now what do we do about it? And that's the million dollar question. Can it be changed? Some people say no. You know, you're, you, the culture guides activities of groups and organizations at a subconscious level. You don't even realize your culture, right? You all walked into this room and there's tables and chairs. No one walked in this room and said, hmm, tables and chairs, that's weird. Right? You just walked in and that's what you expect. Now, if you would have walked in and there's a bunch of pillows on the floor, yeah, but in some cultures that would be fine, right? They might walk in and say, tables and chairs, where are the pillows, right? We don't think about, these are things that we just don't even think about. Um, and it's at a subconscious level. So we can't, how do we change something that we really don't even recognize? Uh, people do not shape their culture, rather their culture shapes them and is often unpredictable and foreseeable. The fact that one might believe that culture can be intentionally changed is in itself a reflection of the culture in which he or she belongs. Now that's one of those, if you really grasp it, your brain will resonate at a particular frequency and explode. But it's the idea here is that, you know, yeah, those damn Americans, they think they can change everything, right? They just do whatever they want. If they don't like it, they change it. Um, so the idea that we come from a culture where we're, we think we can change everything. Some cultures are, you know, particularly some of the Asian cultures are, you know, life is what it is, right? Try to change it, you're gonna get yourself in trouble, right? And so this idea that we can actually change our culture is in fact because of the culture we come from. Um, it's just the way we, we've been indoctrinated to think, but it may not necessarily be true. Other people say, yes, of course we can change culture. Um, you know, why cite safety cultures of cause and of an accident if it can't be changed? So all these accidents that cite safety cultures contributing to the accident must have presumed that in some, re some way, somehow, some fashion, we can change it in order to improve safety. Right? Otherwise, why cite it as a causal factor? We don't, if, we, if, it, if we can't change it, we usually don't cite it as a causal factor. Right? Think about it. How many times have you read an aviation accident report and they cited gravity as the cause? Right? Which it is. I mean, it's probably the, it's the cause of every accident. But we don't cite it as a causal factor because we're like, what are we going to do about it? Right? We, we, we tend to be pragmatic about things and cite things as causal factors that we believe that we can intervene with. And so why cite culture as a cause factor if we don't think somehow we can do something about it? And then anecdotally, several organizations appear to have intentionally engineered or changed their culture. Right? They designed it. Microsoft, Apple, um, Google right? is, is big with their culture, and they've engineered their culture. They can intentionally change and design their culture in a way that they feel is appropriate for what they're trying to do and to get, um, make their employees satisfied as well as get the maximum creativity out of them. And so that's kind of the thing. there. So that, that's really the question that we're asking. What does the data say? It's mixed. In fact, there is no whole lot of data out there because most people who do uh, safety culture assessment do it in-house. It's proprietary information. It's not published. Um, they don't, you know, it's not shared to the, the open public. And so there may be some, some anecdotes within your own organization or others that say, yes, we've been able to change it. But more from a, from a scientific academic perspective, there isn't a whole lot of data that systematically shows significant changes in safety culture as a result of interventions. There's more coming out um, as time goes by. So hopefully um, with the next year or two or so, there'll be a lot more data that we can d definitively say it's, it's, it's mutable, it's changeable, and here's what works. So with that, our learning objectives before we began, safety culture and safety climate, what are they? Um, being prospective, trying to identify it uh, ahead of time rather than looking just back at accidents. 
talked about different organizational indicators, organizational commitment, supervisor involvement, formal and informal safety uh, systems, and then how do we assess it if we can and how can we change it potentially. So with that, um, we have a few minutes left uh, for questions or just sharing about what you do in your organization because this is just my own experience and some of the stuff I've done. If you, you guys, uh, people are involved in organizations that do their safety assessments, um, go ahead and share with the rest of the group because I'm sure we all want to learn from other people besides myself.